Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining this, uh, this session. Um, and we will talk about the, the business case for, uh, for talent. Um, my name is uh, Nick van Dam. I'm a Global Chief Learning Officer for uh, McKinsey. Um, and I'm also my client advisor. Um, and I'm a faculty member of a, a program, a doctorate program at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, a program for, uh, for upcoming uh, chief uh, learning officers. Um, I'm based out of the Netherlands, um, and I'm leading all the learning and leadership development uh, for McKinsey for our 25,000 people. And I'm also part of the uh, executive, the people executive, where we talk about you know, everything what we are doing in, uh, in, in people and talent. Um, what I'd like to do is, as a start is to, uh, to quickly go around uh, the panel members and, and give them the opportunity to introduce themselves briefly um, and reflect um, on, uh, on talent. Uh, this is the first question I have, maybe your, your own company or, or your clients, um, because if we talk about talent uh, in organizations, uh, things have changed over the last five to ten years. Um, so if you reflect on, you know, first you introduce yourself and your company, what you do uh, briefly, and then uh, what is talent in your organization? How do you, how do you define talent? And I start with uh, James. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a CEO of uh, Zoomi. We're an uh, artificial intelligence uh, learning company. And uh, the way I think about um, talent, at least in my organization, is addressing that skills gap um, through deep analytics to uh, uh, enable uh, business outcomes. So keeping those two things separate, in, in my world anyway, isn't, isn't an option. And I don't think there's uh, a ton of intrinsic value to training unless you're linking it to individual and business outcomes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I go to uh, Jason. Good afternoon, my name is Jason Corsello with Cornerstone. I head up uh, corporate development strategy for the company. In terms of talent, um, I think we're going or in process of a fairly significant shift right now, whereas the last decade has been focused very much on the employer needs. And I, see, I think we've seen mixed success across uh, organizations and I would predict over the next five to 10 years it's really gonna be driven by the employees what the employees want. We see that already today, whether it's in learning being self-directed or in performance being feedback driven. So um, I think we're under a fairly significant shift and I'm actually really excited about it. How do you look at talent in your organization? How oh, do you and, define and talent for, for people at Cornerstone? Sorry, good question. Um, so Cornerstone's about 2,000 uh, 2, employees today, uh, of which only about 60% are at headquarters. Uh, most of the employees are, are littered throughout the world. So we think about talent very globally. Um, we move talent around quite a bit, um, whether it's someone that started in the US that's now in New Zealand or someone in, the, uh, in Europe that's now in, in the US. So we look at it very internationally. Yeah. Um, we have a strong push being a learning company ourselves. We have a strong foot push around development. We do everything from development days um, every month where we bring in external speakers. We, out, we use our system obviously quite a bit. Um, but what we're really focused on right now is driving new content through our, to our customers and to our employees um, because we think that's the next interesting wave of, in terms of how you can train is, train is leveraging modern types of content. Okay, thanks for Jason. We go to Kirsten. Great, so I'm Kirsten Neville Manning and I'm from New Zealand, which is why I did a yay, go New Zealand. Um, I've been in the US 20 years now. Um, but I can't get rid of the accent. Um, I'm a chief people off, or head of people at um, a company called Teachers Pay Teachers. We're a platform where teachers can share education materials with each other. Um, before this, I um, actually opened, I'm a small business owner, I opened a tiny uh, coffee shop. Um, it helps me actually relate to some of the entrepreneurs on our site. Um, and then also before that I ran recruiting for a little known company called Facebook for a couple of years. Um, and Oop. for four years I ran um, international HR for them. Um, and I did all their expansion outside of the US. Um, and before that I spent seven years doing expansion outside of the US for uh, Google. Um, so that's where I've spent a lot of my time. And I would say actually for me, the evolution isn't necessarily just in recent times. I was fortunate at Google 
uh, to be at the forefront, I think, of some of the changes that others are catching up with now and that talent is not an HR strategy, it's a business strategy. Um, and at TBT, we link it back to the business through many things that we do um, that we'll talk about, sort of some of the programs we have throughout this, but linking it to business OKRs, linking it to engagement, um, lots of different metrics we use to ensure um, our employees are meeting the business objectives and meeting their personal life objectives too. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, go to uh, Chris. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Duggan, CEO, co-founder of a company called BetterWorks. We're based in Silicon Valley. Uh, we uh, are a software platform for basically enabling continuous performance management, which is how companies think about moving from an annual cadence around goal setting and kind of the traditional process of per managing performance to an ongoing continuous one, one that's based on real-time feedback, manager check-ins, collaborative goal setting, and, and whatnot. And um, you know, I would say you know, we work with about 300 enterprise clients today. What's top of mind for them when it comes to talent is, uh, you know, we're, everybody knows about attracting and retaining talent, but really it's about the team that you have, how do you drive the collective productivity of that, of that organization and uh, drive the performance, develop the performance, and, mm -hmm. and I think that's really what's top of mind for a lot of the leaders that I speak with. Okay, thank you. One, one question for, uh, for the audience. Who is kind of redesigning uh, his or her performance management practices in, in your organization? Okay, a few. Okay, thank you. We so, go to uh, Zach. So Zach Posner, I head up a team called the Learning Science Platforms Team at McGraw-Hill Education. We are focused on how you take adaptive learning into the corporate world. You know, that's a term that uh, has been used around this type of conference for the past couple of years, but it's relatively new in the corporate world. And, you know, when I think of talent, I think of the concept of a diversity of learners, and specifically the diversity of the background of the learners. And if you go, you know, just two doors down, they're talking about how higher education is going to become unbundled. And I think that you're going to see a completely different role in corporate learning. And I think that, uh, you know, it, it's all about how you take the current teams and get them skilled properly for the future jobs. And I think, you know, internally we've seen that shift at McGraw Hill Education. It used to be a textbook publisher, and now we're a learning science company. And how do you help make, you know, a transition with 4,500 employees to that new stage? Mm -hmm. So, and how do you define talent in your organization? So, I I I think that we are. When I think of uh, you're throwing me for a little, when, I, when I we're thinking of the folks that can help to get us towards the company that you know, we, we're moving towards that direction in the next couple of years. And for us, it's a completely different skill set than we've had historically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So. And, but are you looking at, is it a, are you talking about a small group of oh, people sorry. in your organization or is it like a, I'm talking a about five, bigger group? 5,000 folks. Okay, all yeah. of you, yeah, okay. So it's kind of a little bit uh, what I try to, uh, to, to hear it from, from you and also if you reflect on it as well. I think over the last uh, 10 years, what, what you've seen in many organizations is that initially when, um, organizations started talking about talent management. It was all about uh, a small group or a pool of you know, people who have been identified as talented people, critical people for the organization. Uh, what, you see over the what you've seen over the last couple of years, and, and I think more moving forward, that more organizations are saying, do you know what? Uh, the people who we employ are basically talented because why, what's the point of uh, hiring people if we don't believe they are talented? Now, you can identify, you can look at different talent pools in the organization, where you say there are a couple of people in very business critical roles we want to retain no matter what, and therefore we want to provide them with some more personalized talent management um, you know, uh, support, right? So, uh, may I ask you a question? Who looks at talent talent management is more inclusive, like everybody is part of talent in your organization, or talent management? Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so back to the, so we have talent. Uh, back to the, to the business case. Um, there's a lot of technology uh, available today, and even more tomorrow, where we can use data to measure, you know, a lot of things in organizations. Um, to some extent, it's new, but also a lot of things have been in place in the past. What do you think is really new and different today from, let's say, five years ago? Um, may I start with you, Jason? Sure, sure. 
I mean, fundamentally, at the end of the day, a lot of the infrastructure that we use to process data has completely changed. Um, you know, we at, at Cornerstone bought a company about two years ago, a, a data science company. And the way I, we rationalize it, if we wanted to do it in the old way, buying SQL servers and buying the technology, it would have prob probably cost us to 10 to 20x more. So the technology using Hadoop has gotten much more efficient um, uh, and cost-wise, it's, it's way more effective. And so I think the technology that supports it is there. Where I see the challenge today is companies still, in my opinion, don't embrace data-driven products just yet. They want to, they, they're aspirational, but they're still not making that, that leap. I know Burson um, has published some data around predictive analytics, and mm -hmm. I think it was, last year was 8%. So the good news, it was up from 4% to 8%. The bad news is it's still at 8%. So companies feel, fully aren't embracing it. One of the things that we are doing now um, since we bought that company is, is instead of trying to build kind of solutions on top of solutions, let's embed the products into the existing solutions. So let's embed insights into learning products and insights into performance products because that's the way that we think we're going to get adoption and, and embrace people to use them is to actually embed them into the products. Okay. So I, I skip actually, I go to, uh, uh, to Chris. So what's new today? What's very different today than, than five years ago? Yeah, I think building on Jason's answer, um, I would say the quality and depth of the signals that are available to us is really exploding. Mm -hmm. And so it could be things like, you know, when you're doing annual goals in Workday or SAP, now people are doing collaborative cross-functional goals that are connected to systems like Salesforce and Jira. And so we get uh, great data around operational, kind of connecting the operations to the objectives. Um, we can do things like semantic analysis on conversations uh, and check-ins that managers and employees are having at scale. Imagine you have 50,000 people in your company, mm -hmm. you know, which where are the areas where there might be hot spots or areas to, to probe. Um, we can connect that performance data with engagement data and look at like who's it, who's, who you know, surveys, pulses, who's engaged in the company, which managers are transparent, which employees uh, are getting enough sleep. I mean, there's so much data that you can bring together now that I actually feel like that's the first piece here is instrumenting these systems. And I think that what's coming next is, you know, how do you get insights from all of that stuff, whether that's people analytics, uh, other insights, connecting that to retention and risks around that, um, looking for opportunities to drive more performance. I think that's what's coming next. Yeah. Okay, I go to, to Zach actually at the end. What's new, what's different? Yeah, well, I mean, build, I on, build on what has I, been said actually. I, I think you're, you know, to build off of what both these guys just said, I think you're taking the best practices from our consumer lives and starting to apply them to the corporate world. So when you know, we're focused on that data driven, that data layer as it, as it uh, pertains to learning. But when you think about a data layer and taking your preference data, you know, how many of you folks are on like Pandora or Spotify? Mm -hmm. Any, so you know, what you guys do is you hear a song and you skip to the next one and they're paying attention to that data. You give it a thumbs up or you give it a thumbs down, you never see it again. And I think that all of these types of uh, things that we're used to in our personal lives and the fact that you're doing all of this on your mobile device mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are now coming out you know, through software companies like all of us. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so, so it has been said actually that you know, kind of the usage of data is still you know, about at 8%, Early. right? So it's still, still at, a very, you know, at, a, at a start actually. Um, um, Kirsten, you have, you know, you've been in different roles also at Facebook and Google uh, who are known actually for, for, for their talent management practices. Can you say something about, you know, are they using more and more analytics actually um, to feed, you know, decisions and policies in terms of talent management? Yeah, it's hard to speak for them given I'm no longer there, but I would say Shona Brown, who was the head of HR at Google when I was there, um, really brought in a, a layer of sort of data and analytics to everything that we did in HR, um, which informed, and Facebook definitely we used a ton of data. I would say what I think is actually the most different thing is not, it's, um, it's not necessarily the systems um, per se, but it's also that people, we live in a world where people are much more open about who they really are. And as a result, I think these tools actually help facilitate that more in the workplace. So I think there's been sort of a social shift as well in terms of talent management over the last, and I would say that, I'm slightly biased about Facebook, but I think it's really um, helped people bring their authentic selves to wherever they are. And I think at TBT we drive for, uh, we talk a lot about being, um, we have our idealized self, so I look in the mirror and I see somebody 
who's um, 10 years younger and a little slimmer. But my real self, my actual self, is not that. And we talk about that a lot. Like, be your, tell us about your actual self, because that's how we can help you from a talent perspective. If you're actually having a really hard day, we can help you with that, or you actually don't understand a problem. Or if you can nail it, we need to know that too, yeah. because we'll manage you in a different way. And I think I do think this era where we're being a lot more public about a lot of things is, is that coming into our work life. And for us also, I would say, we look at data from the time we put up a job description, or even before, really, as we're writing it, to the time somebody leaves the organization. And there's mm -hmm. data points, which is sort of building off what everyone said, all the way through, that help us understand who's on our team, what can they do, what can we do, what can we learn from them to do a better job. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, James, in terms of the, the solution that your organization provides, uh, also looking at particularly at, 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 at courses actually people take and, and, and explore if, really, if people really you know, acquire knowledge, if they change uh, behavior, et cetera, and um, you know, you're not using the typical you know, uh, test in, in, in courses. Can you, can you talk a little bit about your solution, why you think it's unique? Yeah, I think it's... And help, and help organizations from a talent management perspective to have more insights, better insights in terms yeah. of the impact of uh, the different learning solutions. I think it builds on what uh, Zach and some of the other panels have said about there's a ton of data out there and we've been, me we've been measuring data in our finance vertical and our operations vertical, even in sales and marketing. But in a knowledge economy, arguably the most important thing, which is the people, we haven't really been getting down to that deep level of data. And what I mean by that is um, things like descriptive analytics. That, that doesn't really tell you much in terms of your talent or where people are going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you can get to, similar to, to what Kristen was saying, if you can get down to what people's uh, behaviors or preferences or cognitive preferences are, there's technology available through AI and other very rigorous methods, statistical methods, that you can see the patterns and start predicting things in a very statistically significant way. And I don't feel like a lot of people have been availing themselves of that type of analysis to drive those insights that we're all looking for. And let's face it, that's one of the reasons why people are frustrated about ROI is they can't get to that easily. You know, there's, there's always yet another survey that has to go out or something else to do, and you can't really connect the dots. And I think five years ago that was really difficult, but I think now with, with some of the things that the, the panels have been talking about with the, with the way technology is progressing, we can get to these things fairly easily and at mm -hmm. a low cost. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, so back to the, you know, the, the business case for a lot of the data-driven uh, you know, and, and technologies and, and solutions that currently are available. Um, so what prevent organizations to jump on this? Uh, if the technology is there, we have the data, um, so why, you know, and it provides you know, better insights in terms of impact, uh, perhaps ROI, so what prevent companies to, to, to leverage this more? Zach, may I start with you? Yeah, you're, I mean, you're changing culture. You know, there, there are ways that things have been done for a long time. And you know, all of the outputs that come from the data, you know, that allows you to make better decisions and make, uh, you know, but it, you, you're changing culture, you're changing the way people do things. And I think that there's, you know, in, in any space, there's hesitation when you're doing that. So culture. So how do you change culture? So what needs to happen? So basically so it, when you... From, you know, it, it seems like everybody's doing something relatively innovative on this stage. So I think that it comes with a lot of education mm -hmm. in the sales process, how this is, uh, you know, this type of stuff is not here by any means to replace you. It's here to help you make better decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, from a learning perspective, the data that we generate through our programs can change everything. And it changes the way you know, an employee interacts with their learning. It changes the way uh, an instructor teaches an instructor-led training. And it changes the way that a subject matter creates content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, you know, for us, we're, we're changing workflows in organizations that have existed for a long time. These are the jobs that people have always known how to do. And we're something radically different. And you know, one quick example is this: all of our technology started because McGraw-Hill Education, we, were, we had these textbooks. And, we, the revision cycle was basically every three years, a group of authors or subject matter experts would sit around and say, hey, what is it that needs to be updated here? And they'd have a meeting and they'd go out, they'd come back and they'd essentially update it. Now we put out a new learning program and within 15 minutes we're getting real-time data back 
from mm -hmm. the learners mm -hmm. about which content is effective and which content is not effective. Mm -hmm. So instead of a three-year revision cycle, that could be a three-day revision cycle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And that's a completely different way to think about how you design content. Yeah. So I think it's this change. Chris, yeah. Chris, you know, on performance management, right? So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of data, a lot of articles uh, published over the last uh, two years on, on performance management in Harvard Business Review. McKinsey have published an article that basically shows that, you know, if you look back, actually, uh, it's an extremely time-consuming process. And, and most people who walk out of their, you know, year-end performance re reviews are more demotivated and motivated, independent of the ratings they have. Um, you know, most organizations lack a culture of ongoing feedback, et cetera. So there's a strong case, actually, for changing performance management. Now, you are in that business, actually, and, and if you talk with your, with your clients, actually, what, what are the, the reasons why they are saying, yeah, we are jumping on it, or what, will, what are the, the reasons they are not moving, actually? Yeah, and, and, and I do agree with, with you that it is a lot of culture change, and, and you know, I, the, maybe the big point here is it's not about we want to become more data-driven. I, I think the, the big point is, and what companies tell me is, we want to move more quickly. We need to get much more dynamic, much more competitive, much more adaptable, and we need to just change the pace of how we operate. And so, you know, we can't wait for an annual, you know, review. And we have to move to, you know, quick continuous feedback or ongoing learning and skill development um, because just the nature of our markets is changing. Um, and so then that says, okay, well, how do we become more data-driven? Can we use software to maybe do some of this stuff at scale? Um, you're right that uh, the average manager spends 17 hours doing end-of-year performance reviews mm -hmm. uh, per, per, per employee, so 200 hours per team. Uh, and when, when surveyed, you know, and everybody here is going to relate to this, 8% of people in the workplace believe that it's actually worth the effort. 92% of people that go through that process that you spend 200 hours per manager working on believe it was a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, why not blow that up and come up with new innovative ways to, to kind of engage your workforce? And clearly, there's going to be people that are used to doing it the old-fashioned way, and then there's going to be change agents that are going to take the initiative to drive some new thinking in the company. And I think those are the people that are taking action. It's, this isn't, this is something, it's already happening. It's a movement, and it's moving forward, and it's just going to be the people that are really ready to kind of embrace that, uh, that are going to kind of drive that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Kirsten, you want to deal with um, that? Uh, no, I just, I just echo it. I think, um, yeah, at TBT we don't have the, actually because of my past companies, I didn't want performance appraisal system that was anything like 17 hours per person, and so we have a very quick, uh, I think I, we have a team member in the audience, but um, we have much higher, uh, I think it's in the 90s, of people that actually found it useful, both on the employee and manager side. Um, so we, we've definitely moved to that model. Um, of quick sort of real-time feedback and not grading on a tiny scale that I think drives people crazy. Why did I not get a 3.25 versus a 3.3? Mm -hmm, We've mm -hmm. done away, we don't have any of that. Yeah, so. okay, thank you. Um, so, so, so back to culture, uh, um, Jason. So, so it seems like culture is a big enabler uh, for, for you know, using analytics, new technologies, et cetera. So, so what have you seen as a best practice in, in organizations? Who has figured this out, and, and, and what have organizations done to change their culture and be more uh, aggressive and active in, in, in using all the new So, so I'm going to purposely not answer your question, because I, I want to answer it a little bit differently, which is, you know, we all read about the Googles and the Facebooks, and everyone aspires to be Google, right? Oh, I love what you know, Laszlo's been doing at Google, yeah. and we need to do exactly what he's doing. And the fact of the matter is every company is different. Every company has its own culture, its own DNA, its own pace of change, its own embracement of technology. And I don't think companies do enough of kind of looking in the mirror and really assessing that, truly assessing that. What is our culture? Where are we going? Where do we want to be in three years? And building a program to that. Too often we see, oh, you know, we see our competitors, you know, that went and bought a, a technology, so we better go buy the technology. You know, at McKinsey, I'm sure the way you guys recruit and train and develop your people are completely different from Deloitte, right? Mm -hmm. Because the workforces are completely different, right? Deloitte's changing their workforce, you know, every couple of years. They've got an amazing training program. If you've ever been to Texas, they've got this amazing campus in, in Texas. They've got this cool bar. I enjoyed the bar part. But, um, uh, the, you know, they're, they're 
constantly changing, but that fits to their model. It fits this, they, they built this training program where they can replace every five years and keep, keep the cycle going. Mm -hmm. Where I would envision an Accenture or McKinsey is very different. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, certainly culture is important, but you gotta fully access, assess the, the, the corporation itself. Culture is one component of it. And really understand and, and build a program designed for you, not kind of try to model after the next guy. Okay. Um, uh, James, um, a little bit similar. Like, if you look at your solution, a very unique solution, actually, um, what will what hold people back of using it, and, and, and what are success stories, actually? What, what are the, you, the type of organizations, cultures, who say, yeah, we will start using uh, more uh, yeah. predictive analytics? And, and I think it's mainly the people that are fed up with not being able to get to those answers of ROI and being able to to assess their people, which are, again, supposedly the most important part of the, the organization, mm -hmm. yet they don't measure them to a deep enough level. And I think, you know, Zach had, had mentioned this as well before, you know, you know some of the obstacles are, are frankly, you know, some people just not wanting to, to change or they think that it's gonna require extra work. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if you go in with any solution and it requires somebody to hire a fleet of data scientists or a whole bunch of uh, new people, nobody's gonna wanna do that until it's proven that you can actually get to, to ROI. And so, you know, I guess what we're seeing is people are finally, you know, and, and this wasn't the case three or four years ago, but people are finally just saying, look, you know, I have the data, I can't get any insights out of it. Stop mm -hmm. giving me more data, let's, let's go get some insights and then we'll get more data. Okay, thank you. Um, if I go back to, uh, to overall uh, people development and talent development, um, over the last two years, a number of research reports have been published uh, from Oxford University, uh, the World Economic Forum, and also by McKinsey on uh, the impact of automation and robotization on jobs. And if you look at uh, the different reports and you, you syndicate actually the, the research, uh, basically it, it, it shows that, you know, it tells us the story that over the next five to ten years, um, something somewhere between 20 and 40 to 50 percent uh, of jobs will be automated or robotized globally. Um, that's one data point. Another one is that over the next five to 10 years, there will be many new roles created that don't exist today. Um, I, I led a panel um, um, a couple of months ago with a number of CHROs and asked them the question, um, do you know what kind of competencies are needed over the next three, four, five years? And the answer was they have no idea. So now my question to you is, you know, one of the challenges that I've seen in many organizations is to figure out what kind of skills people have, uh, what kind of competencies, also kind of, you know, what they need in the future and, and what the big gaps are. Um, so how can technology help? Uh, because also I've seen a lot of organizations telling us that, you know, technology cannot necessarily close that, cannot help to figure that out and, and help to close that gap. But who like to talk, who like to react to that? The, the big challenge that, that organizations have in, in, on the one hand, retraining, uh, upskilling uh, existing workforce, but also figuring out, okay, what kind of skills do they need? Um, you know, how to recruit for the new jobs they will create over the next, uh, the next uh, five years. Would like to, Zach, would yeah, you like yeah, to? Uh, I mean, I think in general you hear this term that's popping up, the modern learner. And the mm -hmm. modern learner is always learning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's something that, uh, you know, my wife's a kindergarten teacher. She's teaching kids that are going to retire in 2080 or 90 or whatever the number is. So, um, you know, the profile of the person, yet you always have to be learning. And I think this concept of the unbundling of education as we think of it now. Mm -hmm where everything becomes more um, micro-learning oriented. Mm -hmm. Because that allows you to easily map towards the skills that you guys can see coming. And then the question is just, how do you quickly get folks there? And I think that uh, you know, th there's a lot more talk about uh, the Coursera's, the Linda's. All of these things are kind of popping up because there's all of these new skills that are being defined. And how can you quickly get there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. opposed to you know, a four-year degree and, and things along these time that just by the time you're finished with it, it could be outdated in theory. So I think it has to do with, um, 
you know, breaking things down into their pieces and having a laser-like focus to kind of get there. Mm -hmm. Okay, who else would like to, to, uh, to build on that? Well, I guess I'll go ahead. I mean, I, I love the way that Zach describes it. I think the, the big thing that companies can be doing is teaching their employees actually how to learn and continue to learn. I have three young children, and that's where I spend a lot of my time is figuring out, you know, they're, they're learning all the time. How can I teach them to embed that in when they wake up, when they go to school, when they go to baseball practice, all those types of things. Um, you know, where I struggle with this, you know, I, I, I saw Peter Capelli this morning, and he was fantastic, but he talks about, you know, all this talk about the gig economy and, you know, upskilling and all these things, but really at the end of the day, only 0.5% of the workforce is actually considered the gig economy. So we've been talking about it for five or 10 years, and it's still not there. Certainly there's certain aspects that are becoming more gig-like, but I think we tend to overestimate the pace of change and movement towards um, robotics and things like that. Certainly it's coming, but um, you know, he was using an example of UPS, right? Everyone's worried, of, transportation somehow has become the, the example of, of robots taking over the world. The fact of the matter is, you know, my wife, um, good or bad, buys a lot of stuff from Amazon. So the UPS driver comes to our house a lot. Certainly you can program the truck to get there, but the UPS driver still has to get out of the car, he has to walk to the door, he's gotta figure out a place to put the box. And a lot of those things, I don't think UPS is gonna invest into some robotics that flings that box carefully onto the, onto the porch so um, they eliminate the whole process. So I guess what I'm trying to say is certainly some aspects of, of you know, robots taking jobs is happening, but at the same time, I still think that people are going to need to learn. I, think, I don't think we should be overly dependent on thinking that people are gonna upskill. I don't think we're gonna be able to take the guy that's been sitting on a manufacturing line for 10 years and think that he's gonna go figure out how to program, you know, or, or use Ruby on Rails to build a, a, a program. Mm -hmm. But can we teach people to, to figure out ways to continue to learn and, ups, you know, go, go to the next job or the next job or the next job, possibly? Um, I, I'm not sure if I answered the question, but I, I just I think that there's a lot going on. It's harder to dive. I don't think that learning and development is going to be eliminated, or you know, jobs as we know them today are, are going to be eliminated. I think they're they're morphing more than anything. Okay, thank you. Um, back to, uh, to to measurement um, uh, and particularly uh, ROI. Uh, who is using? R ROI, actually, ROI in, in, in terms of talent management. Who's measuring and get ROI metrics? Okay, a few. So let me go around. So, so can, can we do ROI? Can we really calculate ROI on talent management practices? Pure return on investment. Who would like to start? Would you like to? Um, I, actually, I was thinking about the last question. I had something to add to that, if that's okay. Um, I just, and then I can talk about the business value if you'd like. Um, you know, so uh, just two things came to mind. One is at our company, um, the way that we create a culture of, of learning is we have a, a corporate value that we call 1% better every day. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, one of our four values and that's the spirit of how we communicate with our, with our organization is 1% better every day. It's always improving. It's not necessarily for the formal learning process. I think learning and, and development is part of that. But if people are in that mindset of, you know, the growth mindset or just aspire to be better, and that is, that's part of how you communicate w within the organization, it feels like that's gonna drive you know, some of that. And the other thing that actually really struck a, a chord with me recently is I, I was uh, speaking with uh, Donna Morris, she's the CHRO at Adobe, and uh, speaking to the cultural change that you were talking about, uh, the way that they drive uh, buy-in at the employee level is it's not just, you know, they're not using words like assessment and and reviewing people. It's actually about saying the employee is empowered now to take ownership of their career. And the way that they engage their workforce is about you're ta you have to take ownership if you wanna grow. So in terms of you know, how do you get people to think about this stuff, you actually have to put it in their hands and make them self accountable to kind of how they're actually gonna take, take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who else would like to, to build on that? ROI, does ROI can we do really ROI on talent management practices, on learning, et cetera? So, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there's a, uh, a clear case that, that we're seeing in learning where, um, you know, I, I think the trends that 
all of us are seeing and the way the data gets applied is right now we live in this summative world where for learning there may be a test at the end of the learning in some capacity. For uh, performance appraisals it may be once a year. And you know, the shift that you see when you start to use data is you move it more towards like a formative world. So how are you constantly assessing opposed to assessing once at the end of some time period? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you're constantly assessing, you can make better decisions in a real time basis. So I'm sure, you know, I I'd love to hear what McKinsey's doing, but I'm sure like you guys, you know, you, you could do something in the theory at the end of every engagement that, you're, mm -hmm. that your practitioner's on. Um, so I think the ROI becomes clear where, you know, for instead of having somebody bang their head against a wall for some period of time in learning, you know, we can kind of shorten learning, the learning experience by 50% for most of your learners. But then you have some learners that take a significantly longer amount of time. But what's really happening is when you shift from uh, a traditional conventional model to a mastery based model where you're co constantly formatively assessment, the folks that take a ton of time to complete a training, they're the ones that are actually now everybody's like ready to perform. Mm -hmm. So I think you can really clearly see some, I think on the learning side at least, we're seeing ways that the ROI is clearly there. Mm -hmm. But in general, I think this theme from going from a summative world to a formative world produces ROI because you can make better decisions in shorter amounts of time and then that drives business outcomes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I, I think, then I go to James. I think it comes down to what are you using ROI for? Mm -hmm. Most people just use ROI to sell the business case so they can go out and buy something, some product or some service. Mm -hmm. And where I think companies need to think about it, and I think someone said it is more thinking about viewing it as more, what, what's the return on investment for my organization? What's the business value that it's driving? And it gets back to my earlier point that every company probably should calculate a little bit differently um, because they're going to care about things, right? ROI could, attrition could affect ROI. Customer sat of the tool can, can affect ROI. You know, we use uh, our CTO bought Pluralsight. Pluralsight's here at the conference and it's a great product. I don't use it because I'm not a developer. But um, we spent a lot of money on it. And the fact of the matter is that if, if we told him tomorrow that, you know, we, gotta, we can't use it anymore, it's too expensive, his team would freak out. So what's the return on on that, knowing that our, de that our developers are very happy because they get a tool that they're constantly able to learn with. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I have been, uh, ROI is a bit in the eye of the beholder. What I would encourage is everyone to think about it as how is this thing that I'm doing impacting my organization? And it should be broader than just spending on technology. It should be broader than just thinking about it from a single dimension. It should be multi dimensional. Why, you know, learning and development, you're thinking about the impact of recruiting the impact of managing performance, the impact of engagement, things like that. Mm -hmm. okay. Kirsten, any? I don't really have no? anything to add. Okay. To okay. okay. I know from a learning perspective, you probably, uh, you yeah, mentioned was, already a couple of times, so yeah. ROI, James, so yeah. uh, what's your? Yeah, I, I just think it's being able to break whatever content you're assessing down to, its, uh, down to an atomic level so that you can then link it to the business outcomes you're seeing, whether it's operational metrics, or financial metrics, because then you can make those correlations. And so to, to, uh, to your point about um, you know, somebody saying, oh, well, I'm just happy with this. That, that's not good enough for the CFO or the CEO oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, that's why programs get cut, good programs, because people aren't able to get down to a, an appropriate enough level to say, this is driving this outcome. But I think the technology uh, exists um, to do that now. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, from a McKinsey perspective, um, we are measuring everything. We are extremely fact-driven. Fact um, and um, I never got uh, a question uh, to come up with any ROI calculations for any investment that we are making in, in people. Um, basically, uh, you know, we have, we have regular sessions with, um, with the board uh, on everything what we are doing in people. Uh, at McKinsey, we are investing about $600 million in, in, in both knowledge management and, and learning, um, and we are never using any ROI calculation. Uh, we know that um, the investments, in, it's also part of our culture, uh, of course we are a people culture, um, you know, investment in, in, in people is basically our investment in ROI, and, and we know that it will, it will pay off. Now, um, 
some of you might be familiar with um, the organization health uh, index that we uh, that we have developed and that we run in a number of you know we've run already in, in thousands of organizations where you basically people answer every day a question so instead of having these questions we have a question is where people are spending 15 20 minutes uh, basically this one question a day uh, and that will provide a, amazing data and insights uh, on a number of different dimensions in an organization which are predictors how an organization will perform uh, over the next uh, two or three years. Uh, and one dimension is the quality of leadership. Another dimension is the, 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 the capabilities, the people capabilities in the organization. And you can find articles on, on the internet if you, if, you do an, uh, if you search on McKinsey and the organization health, uh, health index. Um, so if we look ahead actually, um, uh, in five years from now, and we are sitting here again and we talk about uh, talent management and the business case for talent management, um, what will be different? What has shifted or what will shift over the next uh, five years? I can start. Yeah? If, unless anybody else wants to go. <laughs> uh, so I, I guess what I would say is I think even more convergence. So I think. We saw all, you know, all of these areas within the HR stack were you know, fairly traditional, fairly legacy over the last five years. And I think there's a, some really interesting innovations happening. Data, insights, analytics, instrumentation, connecting with daily systems, um, modernization, focusing on the experience, making them delightful, uh, mobility. That's all happening now. So you know, I guess if you fast forward a few years, you know, and actually one of my takeaways from the panel today is uh, I just think uh, th there's going to be even more convergence. So performance and the learning should work together. So if I'm in my performance system, why isn't it suggesting things that I should actually go and learn? Mm -hmm. Or why isn't it connecting me with a real-time coach if mm -hmm. I feel like that's actually going to help me drive more performance? Or if I'm a manager that's having a challenge with an employee, you know, how can I uncover some you know, ways to remove those roadblocks? Or if an employee is not feeling motivated at work, can that can it actually make some connections for you to figure out how to solve that problem? So I, it, you know, I think the the convergence of these things into a seamless experience to me seems like that's an inevitability. Um, it could be pretty interesting. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to it. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Um, I hope in the next five years everything becomes much more personalized. So back to my earlier statement that it's becoming much more employee-driven versus employer-driven, personalized to some of the things that Chris mentioned, which is I want to be able to, when I log on to my learning management system, to be able to, the system to tell me what courses I should be taking based on my skills, my interests, my background, courses I've recently taken, where I want to go in my career, and it just puts that content front and center. Um, we're working on a lot of stuff to, to get you there, but um, it's really personalizing not just that experience, but tying it all in together with where should I be going in my, my career at the company? What paths, what options do I have available? And it's not you know, the H administrator. In a lot of cases, it's not even your manager that's putting that in. It's the systems that's basically telling you as a user where I can go in my, my career. Now, right now, it's deathly, it, it, it's, HR departments are deathly afraid of this right now because they, to some extent, lose control. And this is the big shift that we need to make is you know, eliminate all these barriers because these are things that you, you have to be doing to your employees or they're gonna leave. And the smart companies are getting it. The smart companies are putting these things in place, but um, this is happening. It's going to happen. People, you know, systems are gonna tell you, um, tell your, your best employee where they can go in their career. And the fact of the matter is you're not, they're probably gonna call up that manager and know, hey, I wanna go work for that person. Mm -hmm. So how can you as a organization, as a culture, embrace these types of things and it's happening it's converging you know, across learning, performance, su managing succession, all of those types of things. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I think it will be more personalized. I think it will be more real time, or I hope it will, because I think that's actually where you can lose out on really real growth, is if it's not real time, if it's sort of after something happened a lot later, it's hard to link it back. I think it will be much more linked to technology. Like, I, I do think, I guess I'm more of a believer that technology is moving pretty quickly, so five years seems like um, a lot Long will time. have happened, so mm -hmm. I think VR will be interesting. I, don't, I think that's going to have interesting um, 
sort of play over for how we manage it, where, where we work, what that looks like. Uh, um, so I think there's gonna be a lot of evolution. The other thing I'm excited about is that more and more companies and people, as they get into this, I think that helps the whole ecosystem. Because I think when it was just formally sort of Google at the beginning, I think that was part of this real revolution. Um, now that there are more and more companies, you're speaking the same language and people are understanding um, and are more used to this because that's part of the cultural change as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the world will be much more just sort of open and transparent in five years. Okay, thanks Houston. I think the, aside from the technology, which I agree with everyone uh, that's spoken already, I, I think the single biggest trait that people are going to have to have in five years is adaptability. Problem solving, dealing with uncertainty, learning, mm -hmm. learning is a component of that, yeah, yeah. interpersonal adaptability. But that's probably one of the biggest, when you talk about obstacles that I see just from a people standpoint. Well, we've always done it this way. We've always, we can't change. We can't do this. And so I think, um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, K through 12 or college, I, I just think there's a huge lack of teaching people that. I think it's going to hurt in five years if people aren't there. Problem solving. Yeah. 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 It's a key competence identified by the World Economic Forum by 2020, yeah, number one. Uh, Seth, the last... Uh... All, the, all the above, I mean, <laughs> I, I, all, everything that everybody's saying, a per, you know, a personalized world where data standards hopefully converge a little bit more so data can go out in and out of systems to help improve outcomes. I think that, um, you know, I'm hoping it's, I'm hoping we get the small data side of it right. You know, we mm -hmm. talk a lot about big data, machine learning, all of these huge, issues but like you know let's let's kind of use data to make like simple decisions first get that part right mm -hmm. and then kind of go into some of the complexity yeah. okay i want to thank you for i want to thank the panel for uh, for uh, for all your for sharing your perspectives <laughs>